As the astronomer Fred Hoyle put it, the possibility that the parts of a living organism would spontaneously come together by sheer luck is about as likely as a hurricane blowing through a scrapyard spontaneously assembling a Boeing 747. So how does nature do it? Even a fly is arguably more complex than a 747. If there is no designer, how did the complexity and variety of life come about? There's a clue to how the process works in many people's back gardens. There aren't many times when the pigeon has played a starring role in science, but it was this commonplace bird that started Darwin on his journey of discovery. Darwin noticed that pigeon fanciers were able to breed new varieties. By carefully selecting mates, they had turned the ordinary pigeon into dozens of weird-looking birds with weird-sounding names. There were fantails, jacobins, short-faced tumblers and a score of other varieties. Darwin knew these all originated from one bird, the rock dove. And the pigeon breeder, Pat Pratt, can demonstrate that Darwin was right. If our fancy pigeons are allowed to breed as they like without any intervention at all from, from us, then in no time at all they will revert to this wild type. Usually the first or second crosses from our fancy pigeons will show some return to the drab blue colouring of the rock dove. The effort to create different types is called artificial selection. But perhaps, Darwin reasoned, a similar process could occur in the wild. But how could selection work in nature without a divine pigeon breeder to do the work? The work of natural selection is classically illustrated by the finches Darwin found on the Galapagos Islands. There are some 13 species, all with different beaks. Yet these varieties all evolved from one ancestral species, which arrived from the mainland with one type of beak. One now behaves like a woodpecker, using a cactus spine to hunt for grubs. Another now feeds on ticks living on giant tortoises. While a third, the vampire finch, feeds on the blood of seabirds. These are all activities requiring different types of beak. Natural selection is about survival. The beaks changed because the changes helped the finches to survive and there wasn't a designer in sight. When Darwin first explained evolution by natural selection, many people either wouldn't or couldn't grasp it. I myself flatly refused to believe it when I first heard it as a child. For Darwin's theory to succeed, it had to explain both the wonderful variety of nature and its astonishing complexity. It does both with the utmost elegance. My colleague George McGavin has devised an experiment to show how natural selection works in practice. It explains how insects acquire their camouflage. They do it tiny bit by tiny bit. What we've got here is a, an artificial woodland floor on which I've placed a variety of insects. Some of the insects are very easy to see. Some of the insects are not so easy to see, and a few of them are extremely hard to see. OK, what I want you to do is to pretend you're in a woodland, OK? And it's sort of darkish, OK? And you're, you're hungry birds, OK? And you're hunting for insects to eat. So if you see anything which you might want to eat, you can say, I can see an insect. Right. Who can see an insect? Me! Right, how many can you see? Four, uh, three, two. Three. Two? I can't see any. The children play the role of predators. They show that even a little camouflage gives an insect some advantage, so long as its predators don't get too close. I think I saw something. No. Hey, bye. 
Mm. How about that one there? On I the saw click? that one. What's that? I saw that one. A caterpillar. A caterpillar. No one spotted that, that one. one. No one's got that on now. That's the last one. I did. I spotted. spotted that one. I did forget. If you're obvious, your chances of being eaten are very high, and therefore over time, small changes, which make you not so obvious, will be selected and will be passed on. And so, at the end of thousands of years of evolution, the end result will be, or ought to be, an insect which is extremely well hidden in its background. The success of those hidden insects shows how natural selection rewards even tiny changes. The process of natural selection explains how simple structures over millions of years eventually evolved into complex, astonishing creatures like the dinosaurs. Or us. But natural selection is not some kind of award ceremony where nature applauds interesting new genetic mutations. It's not nature's fashion show. It's a competition to the death. Each individual within every species competes in the harsh, even bloodthirsty real world for access to resources and for opportunities to reproduce. Natural selection is all about living long enough to pass on your genes. Darwin realized that wild animals compete to survive. More are born than the food supply can sustain. Inevitably, many die young or otherwise fail to reproduce. Amidst this widespread slaughter, every animal fights a relentless battle for survival. In the natural struggle for existence, some variants were better at surviving than others, and they passed their good qualities on to the future. Natural selection explains how we got to where we are now. But does it also suggest to you a dark and troubling answer to the question why we are here? Natural selection suggests that we, like all other animals, are survival machines. We are here only to compete long enough to pass on our genes. This seems to be the purpose of our lives, the reason we are here. But can this really be the only purpose of human existence? I don't think so. Darwin's remarkable theory offers a second meaning of the word purpose. It's an inspiring one, which accords more fully with our own view of our better selves. It stems from the curious observation that we humans appear to be breaking Darwin's rules. <laughs>